my biggest fear about the industry is that architects are no longer drawing what needs to be built. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I'm joined by Chris Butler, a stalwart in the construction industry and the managing director of Walter Lilly. Chris's journey with Walter Lilly began in 1998, where he became the firm's very first sponsored undergraduate student from Loughborough University. From 1998 to 2002, he honed his expertise in construction engineering management, laying the foundation for a remarkable career. Upon completing his degree, Chris transitioned seamlessly into a full-time role as a surveyor with Walter Lilly. Over the years, he demonstrated a steadfast commitment to excellence, steadily advancing through the ranks. By April 2015, his contributions were recognised with his promotion to surveying director, and just a few years later, in 2018, he assumed the role of managing director. Chris's passion extends beyond his own career. He is deeply invested in the future of the industry, sponsoring students at Loughborough University and championing young talent through day release programs. It's an honor to have Chris with us today to share his insights on leadership development and the future of construction. In this episode, we will be discussing the leadership of design and construction teams on complex projects. We look at the challenges the construction industry faces with diminishing skills in both the trades and with architects and with their knowledge of construction science. We also look and consider the architect in the past as the master builder and their role today. So sit back, relax and enjoy Chris Butler. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello listeners, we hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Chris, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. Now, I've been a, a fan of Walter Lilly for, um, for quite a while and have been uh, looking at the sort of incredible work that you do right across the, the UK, um, particularly uh, as, you know, as, as contractors in the high-end super prime world of property in London. But you also work on um, a lot of sci- uh, science facilities and higher education, um, landmark and heritage buildings, as well as some some other you know complex construction typologies uh, so i was very pleased to get your uh, acceptance of our invitation to come on the podcast and be able to sit down and and talk with you a little bit about water lily and your career and actually working with with architects so why don't we start with um you've been at water lily for about 26 years or so is it i was gonna say this must be my 26th year i think i i started well, really, I started as a work experience student from school where I was sent uh, for two weeks in the summer holiday to do some work experience, work out what I was going to do for a living. And I never really left after that. I I worked holiday work when I could as a 16, 17-year-old. And then I suppose, in all honesty, my dream was to play sport. Uh, right. That was my that was my dream as a 17-year-old. I'm, gonna, I'm going to university to play sport. Best place for that is Loughborough. Mm-hmm. Uh, in England, so I was go. I had my heart set on going to Loughborough, uh, and then unfortunately, on the careers day, uh, when we went to see the Loughborough Stand for Sport, they announced that they were changing the rules for entry that year, and you needed to be county standard at two sports and not just one. So it kind of put a bit of a nail in my coffin in terms of what that was. And then I, as you can imagine, the grumpy seventeen-year-old dragging their knuckles around the floor uh, with their parents. Um, my my mother from a distance spotted that there was a Loughborough logo on the construction management degrees at, at Loughborough University. Right. So she said, well, why don't we have a look at this? So I went over and had a look. Um, I'd actually done a survey before that said that I'd be naturally suited to be a quantity star. Right. Um, but it you know, wasn't even in my sphere because it was all about sport. What was, what was your sport of choice? Uh, so I was... It just so happened six months later, I became county standard at tennis and rugby. 
Oh wow! Rugby, rugby in the winter, tennis in the summer. Um, so it was good. I, I, I just I'm a competitive human being. I like sport yeah, and I like keeping fit. So anyway, part of that, and thank God I did because my body uh, fell apart soon, soon up. But um, so I looked at a, a degree course, and it so happened that Loughborough did two, and they were both sponsored courses, and you couldn't get onto them without sponsorship before you went. Right. And one, one was uh, commercial management and quantity surveying, and one was construction engineering management. And I thought the construction engineering and management sounded more like me. That was site management. That was <laughs> out on site, dealing with people, using your hands. That was much more me than sitting behind a desk. And um, so I went and looked at that, got my A-levels, um, and ended up being sponsored by a company called Lovell. And Lovell was the group name that owned Water Lily. Right. And once Water Lily knew that I was being sponsored by Lovell's, they said, well, hold on a minute. He came to us for kind of work experience and holiday work. Can, can we take it over from you? Uh, so that was how that relationship properly gathered pace and I got a contract. I was sponsored by Walter Lilly now to do a construction engineering management degree. And four years through it, it was a, what they used to call a thin sandwich. So you had six months in your second year out in industry and six months in your third year out in industry. And then you went back for your final year and then you hopefully went and joined your your sponsor and company. Quite amazing, really, that that that, that you've had your career pretty much in, in one place for that long. I was going to say, so I, um, I got to the end of my degree. Uh, it was Easter time, graduating in the June, July time. And my line manager stroke, I think he was a director at that point, came to see me and said, this is the contract we want to offer you. So it was a big moment for me. I was like, okay, I've got a contract. I don't need to worry about going and looking for a job or anything else. And they offered me to be a quantity surveyor, which is what I did all my work experience in. Anytime I had a placement, anytime I did holiday work, and actually, I think if I added up the time spent working for Walter Lilly in the four years I was at uni, I think there was more weeks worked at Walter Lilly than there was at, spent at university. <laughs> but every day was as a QS. And I was right. learning how to be a manager. And when I came back to uni and everyone was like, oh, I was playing on a crane and I was playing with a dumper truck and a roller. And I was like, yeah, I sat at a desk and used a spreadsheet. It's yeah. kind of missed out a little bit. Anyway, they offered me a position as a quantity surveyor, not a trainee, not an assistant, straight in, fully fledged quantity surveyor, which I thought, well, do you know what? That's that's a that's a good start. Mm-hmm. And and I was wait, I weighed it up for a while because again, I played sport on a Saturday, and site managers were expected to work on a Saturday morning. Um, so I thought, do you know what? I could be a QS. That, that means I don't have to work weekends. That kind of works for me. You get a bit of both. So I accepted the offer to go to Waterloo and be a quantity surveyor. And I'm going to say out of the 13 people that finished the course, all bar one went to their sponsoring companies. So it's a very right. good route into industry. It's a very good, it works for both parties. Yeah. Um, so I um, joined Water Lily, became a surveyor and did my first couple of jobs. And it wasn't until probably five years into my experience that I got enough courage up to ask the director who offered me the contract why he thought I was better suited to quantity surveying rather than site management. <laughs> and his response was, because that's the degree you did. And I <laughs> I took five sessions and gently reminded him that that's not the degree I did at all. I did a construction engineering management degree. So it's complete fluke. Uh, they just didn't know. But I actually think it's done me the world of good because I've learned that underst- and understand how to be a site manager and what's important and the and the items of it, but I've got experience of being a QS. And in the industry, site management is all about building to program. Uh-huh. And QSing is all about doing it for the right money. And those two things don't often go together. Uh, so I think people want to get quicker. So well, what was it that's, that's had you then stay at Water Lily and not kind of bounce around or go to other firms? They must have been doing something right or that you felt that your career progress was was best suited going deep into one organization? I think, if I'm honest, I'm going to say I was never driven and looking and looking around, but mm-hmm. I've always been driven. I've always known from the very early on I wanted to be the managing director of Walter Lilly. If you go back to my reviews 
it all said, you know, future lift manager at Water Lily. <laughs> I think, if I'm honest, I think they just looked after me. I never had to approach them for any money. Money was never a driver for me. Yeah. It was, and it wasn't necessarily about title. It was just, they looked after me. So I never really thought about anything else. I just, and the opportunities and the jobs that I got to work on, you know, you just don't get to work on. Uh, whether it's very old listed buildings, whether it's some very high level containment lab, labs for research facilities or for universities, or whether it's for multi-millionaire billionaires who you never get to see behind their front door sort of thing. So it's just, there's always something of interest. Um, and, and actually it, it worked very well as well because every two or three years I'd move divisions, move sectors. So right. do three years of high-end resi and then you've kind of gone, okay, I've had enough of that. And then when I did another two or three years of science and found enough of that and then and so all of a sudden I've got a I've got a good experience of all the different divisions. So again, I think that's probably luck. I think I'm I don't think I can pretend that they saw something in me at twenty two or nineteen that went, Do you know what, we need to give him all all the training and get make sure he understands it. Or I think it was pure luck that at that precise moment there was a job that came in, they wanted me to do it and it just uh-huh. happened to be something different. So in the last 26 years, or let's say six years previous, the first 20 years, I got a really good experience of all the different industries. I got good experience of how the head office works. I just, and I'm local. I'm a local boy. I was a local company. We've moved twice in my in my work time, but I'm going to say that twice has been no more than two miles. Uh, so we've always been kind of based in Croydon. Which is yep. you know, South London. Yeah, I'm I'm in Purley right now. Oh, okay. So it just yeah. it just works really well. It just works really well. Um so I've never really had my head turned. I've got to be completely honest, I wasn't expecting to become M D quite as quickly as I did. Mm-hmm. It, even when, when I even when I was a board director, uh I thought, okay, I could I'm gonna be a board director for ten years and then it'll be a chance to step up. But the current M D at the time uh, had some luck, had some premonitions about what he was doing when he was younger, buying land, buying houses, and he had the opportunity to retire at 50, mm-hmm. which was probably seven years earlier than I thought he was going to retire. So being offered the opportunity of being MD of Water Lily at 38, I think I was, was a, it was a bit of a wake-up call because if I'm completely honest, I sat down and went, what, that's never going to happen. Yeah. And he, he, he actually said, no, no, it's yours. Go and take it. Go and Go and take that. And he, to be fair to that MD, he was my mentor. He was my line manager. He was a director that I followed all the way through from 16. I was shadowing him at 16 years of age. So uh, maybe there's always been a little path being torched in the grass for me. What What would you say are the kind of, what, how would you describe what the role is of being the MD of, of Waterloo? What, what are your kind of the main responsibilities and how, and how has it, how is it like different from being a QS? Okay, that's an interesting question because I, I will take you back about um, 12, maybe 15 years. Mm-hmm. And we were, uh, Andrew Crispin, who was the previous MD I've just been speaking about, he and I were interviewing the new sponsored students for the for the next intake at Loughborough because we've kept that up. That's a big thing. About right. And it's bringing people through. And it actually gives me the most enjoyment from the job is seeing people grow. Uh, I, I, I really dislike people that take the limelight from other people's work for me it's all about watching people grow and giving them the opportunity to spread their wings and right and become better but we were we were interviewing this young chap he can't be more than 18 maybe even 70 and he sat there and at the very end of the interview and he'd done quite well at the very end of the interview we asked him if he had any questions and he had a couple and his last question were do you enjoy what you do and i looked at andrew and andrew looked back at me and he said you go first and i went oh i love it you know, and I wax lyrical for about 10 minutes about QS and it's people, it's making money, it's um, it's on site, it's behind a desk. You'd never do the same day twice. You're on a different construction site every couple of years. You know, what's not to like? It's brilliant. And I finished and I looked at Andrew and I said, your turn. And he looked at this young chap and he went, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> and he even said, this, 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 this young chap could have walked out we wouldn't have noticed because I just turned to Andrew and said, what are you talking about? What do you mean you don't like it? This is what I want to do. Why don't you like it? What's the problem? And he said, well, everything you just said, I don't do anymore. 
And that's the fun part. Mm. He said, all I'm dealing with is trouble. All I'm dealing with is either human beings who are either in-house and having problems or human beings from a consultant side that are having issues or we're struggling to deal with or human beings on the client side who are unhappy or or whatever, disappointed. She said, all he's ever dealing with, all he ever does is fight fights. And in my in my world, my world is a young, mid twenty year old maybe. Well, I'll do it differently. It'll be different for me. <laughs> um, uh, it's not so different. But I would what I would say is I'm I'm a big fan of psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, I in my head when I get to a point where I can't do this anymore because I'm just burnt out or I'm too old and too grumpy. Um, psychology is something that interests me. Understanding the mind and getting people to getting people to do things without them realizing you're getting them to do it Mm -hmm. is an art form um and that's kind of how i picture it so when back in my mid-20s i was no i'll do it differently because i'm all about people uh i'm not necessarily all about the qs measurement and making money i'm about people Mm -hmm. the biggest part for me is making sure my staff are happy because if i have happy staff they're going to try their best for me uh so it's all about the people for me so I, i suppose that's my role my role is people i have I have a pre-construction team who try and win the work. I have a t- delivery team that try and deliver the work. I have an FM team that look after the work when it's finished. I probably have I probably have the relationships in the network, so I probably need to go out and understand what's going on in the world and see what's going on. But the rest of the time is making sure people are being looked after properly. It's interesting, actually, kind of um, what you were talking about as well with your previous career as a as a rugby player as well and I imagine like just there's a lot of psychology that goes in from being a high performance sports person and and knowing kind of either if it's even if it's just intuitively that you're paying in a you're playing in a team and you'd get a very good sense of what it takes to make sure that everyone is performing to um performing together and I see that a lot with sports people who kind of move into and business and they're very good at kind of um, taking hold of like leadership and being able to get the best out of a, a group of people. What, what's the kind of culture that you like to, you know, or how, what, what are the sorts of things that you like to do to make sure that the, the team is operating well together? Or what, and what sorts of mistakes would have you seen other leaders make that perhaps you were like that? Uh, so I was going to say, so I think something that I picked up from a very early age was recognizing the positive traits of individuals and recognizing the negative traits of individuals and just trying to trying to implement the positive parts and leaving the mm-hmm. negative parts away. And I've done that throughout my whole career. In terms of team sports, I mean, I'm trying to convince my son to play a team sport. Because, not because I want to live my sport through him, mm-hmm. but because I think it's so important to understand how team works. Because when you come to work, you're working in a team. Yeah, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you do in life. You'll be working in a team in some form or other. Because even if you're a sole trader, self-employed, you won't be sitting on your own in a room doing nothing. It, you'll have people to talk to. You need to understand people's personalities. Uh, and I'm again going back into the theory of you know Maslow's theory and the, all the different um, leadership styles, all the different management styles, teamwork and how you can't have five of the same characteristic some of the same five of the same people with the same characteristics because you need those opposing views you need those those conversations that might feel a bit difficult you know that feel a bit uh, confrontational or they're full of conflict but really all it is is people with different opinions mm-hmm. and if you if you're open to listening to other people's opinions and not just feigning interest and pretending to listen, and just going full steam ahead with your own ideas. Uh, that 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 would be probably one for me that you you know always willing to listen. And I always thought I was a good listener. Um, my wife's a talker; I'm a listener. Um, but it so happens that over the last few years, I've realised that I talk too much. And maybe it's because I talk too much at work that actually I go home and go, I don't want to talk anymore. I'm, I'm <laughs> Or maybe I just don't get a word in anyways. I'm not sure. Um, but I think I think what I do struggle with and the mistakes I make is that I sit in a room with 10 people and I hear a question come across from one of the 10 
and it's not directed at me and I try really hard to stay quiet but I listen to the answer that's given and I sit and go well that's not the question they asked and I, I know what they asked and I've heard what they've asked I understood what they meant and it might not be a really pinpointed question but I can mm -hmm. somehow pick up the tone and the facial and the movements expressions and the words and find I know exactly what they're asking and I kind of had to jump in and say well that's not quite like what they asked what they asked is this and put it in a different way and and then I still don't hear this right answer coming back from my team and they get well I'm going to have to jump in here and I really don't want to but I do but that's not giving them a chance to learn and have that conversation to try and get to the point where they understand each other well enough that they create a relationship then they know what I'm picking up so I, that's definitely some one of the learnings I've got is to just try and hang back and it's very difficult to watch people make mistakes that you know are going to happen. Well, this this is, this is something I you know I talk to a lot of business owners, and you know one of the their fears, if you like, um, as they become you know uh, higher up in their leadership, is to not either not micromanage other people, and to allow people the space to make mistakes. And then there's obviously the fear of someone making a mistake on your watch, or you know it's your business and. They're going to cost you money, and you're going to have to be the one that 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 clears uh, cleans it all up. Um, but also, you, you need to be able to give people the space to be able to go through the to learn it, actually properly learn something. And you know, if you can mitigate that their mistakes, then great. But that, that's a, that's a really difficult. I see people, um, business owners, business leaders, struggle with that all the time of just being able to let go and allow a little bit of chaos to happen, but in a controlled manner, so it's not damaging anything it's interesting you that you you use the word control there because i'm going to say the people that i've met and listened to in terms of successful people they're control freaks yeah they're in control of everything until it's too big for them to control on their own mm. and then they've got to let go and that's really hard so even to the point now where people say do you want to be invited to this meeting and i say of course i do but i'm not going to i'm not um, <laughs> i don't need to be there i trust you go and go and go and do it but in my in my soul, in my bottom of my heart, yeah, so you want to be involved, yeah, be there. But also because it also takes me back to what I enjoy doing. You know, mm -hmm. being part of that fun part is enjoyable. So anytime I get to touch that side, you kind of yeah, I want to do. That. But no, I've got to I've got to sit back, and I, I also don't have enough time to, in my life to be able to do everything that I want to do. Let alone go to the meetings that I'm not invited to and, and shouldn't be at. Um, <laughs> How, how how big is Water Lily these days? How many um, employees do you have that are kind of directly working in the in the core group? So in the company we have, uh, I'm going to say it must be 163, 164 at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're growing, we're growing because it's got busy over the last month. So we are positively employing at the moment. Um, I expect it to get up to probably about 175 in the next month or two. Um, so it's it's. And and the, and the you know the rule book says no more than seven direct reports because you can't give them all the time of day you need to give them. Give is there more than that? But it's difficult because maybe your seven direct reports don't quite deal with their seven direct reports as you would, right? And you kind of know, and you've grown up with them, and they've worked with you for the last twenty years. So you kind of know how they should be treated and what they're going to need to make sure they're successful and positive. Uh, but you have to just stand back and say, no, no, that's that's your lookout biggest problem I suppose is because our company we we have an average length of service of about eight years mm -hmm. uh, for construction it's massive uh, we wow. have people that have been with the company 40 odd years so a lot of us have grown up together and learned together and know each other really well so asking someone to report to their line manager rather than skip a level or two and they come straight to me mm -hmm. it's really difficult because I have to sit there and go no no don't talk to me yeah, but Chris, I know it's going to come to you in the end, so why can't I just ask you? And you can answer. I said, no, no, you've got to go through the, got to go through the process. I'm really sorry, but it's going to take longer. I know, but just you've got to go and do it. That's right. And it's going to you're you're going to annoy your line manager by skipping them out. So well, what, 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 what does the internal organisation look like? So you're talking here that there's seven people that you you kind of speak with, and then they've got seven people, and it's kind of like a tree that's. Um, spreading out. I mean, a lot of businesses aren't that well organized and we see kind of flat hierarchies and you've got the managing director and they're getting, they're getting themselves sucked into stuff that's happening, you know, on site and dealing with too much stuff. It takes a lot of 
discipline and organization. What, what, what's the kind of internal structure of Water Lily and where did that come from? So far from perfect. Let's not pretend that we are seven and seven and seven and seven and then how much points and so uh, far from perfect. But the, the way it's set up is you have uh, me as the MD. You then I then have two operational directors, uh, one construction biased, one commercially biased, but they both overlap on the necessary projects. And then I have a pre-construction director. So there's three directors below me. So the pre-construction director has his team in the office that deals with all the pre-construction. And then the operational construction bias looks after all the production site managers, project managers, project leaders, division divisions. And then you have uh, the, the operations director commercially bias who looks after all the commercial teams. And he also has the IT and he has design management. Um, and then below that, we've actually got divisional directors employed to head up each division. Right, and I and I introduced so that's twenty five years ago we had divisional heads, divisional directors, and then those divisional directors uh, became very good and they got invited to join the board. But then, as the board, they didn't introduce new divisional directors; they just looked after their divisions from a board level rather than a divisional direct, director level. And I'm going to say three years ago, I've been thinking about it for a while, but three years ago I said no, we want, I want to introduce that level back in, okay. and the, and the bit. The penny dropped for me, I'm going to say within a three, four, five months of being MD. One of my staff members, I bumped into them on a construction site. And they said, Chris, this is coming to an end. Where's my, when's my, where's my next job? I said, why are you asking me? Oh, you know, because you know everything's going on. You know where the next job is. You know how we're going to win it. You know where it's going to be. And I was a bit like, okay. But there's 130 of us in the business one person going and doing the networking and finding the new jobs as opposed to all 130 of us talking to the people we know and finding out what's going on surely there's opportunity here to okay. grow everybody's network and it will and it will benefit everybody so we did all that we introduced uh business development to the business and, and i'm going to say 15 of them said yeah i'm interested in doing that i'd like to do that and so we brought 15 in we trained them because it's black magic to a lot of people, but it's, it's right. very difficult, really. And then it got to the point where we were trying to grow. And again, the four directors with these 15 people have been trained, but they're new at it and they're starting their networking journey. So there's still four board directors trying to win work for a growing business that just constantly needed feeding, but they're also having to concentrate on delivering it and, and managing it and making sure it's been delivered. It was just too much. We were, we were breaking at the seams. So I... I introduced another layer of divisional directors whose responsibility it was to deliver their work in their division, plus find their new work for their division, which left the board of directors to steer the ship. Uh -huh. if, if the divisional directors are putting the fuel in, we can then steer it and make sure we're going in the right direction and we're not dropping the ball anywhere and we've got a higher level, higher level view, which has, which has worked very well. What it's done is it's cost us a bit more money, which means we're not making as good a profit as we probably should be because we are giving ourselves a chance to to grow which probably means one step backwards to go two step forwards sure uh, but it's a good thing it's working it's working really well but that, that's that's a really interesting and that you actually kind of spent a little bit of time identifying people who had an interest in wanting to learn about business development and rather than just kind of you know because you got the risk there if if you had too many of the the directors being the uh, the sole people that were doing business development, and then they start to retire or leave, then you've you've got a problem. You've got the, uh, that's exactly uh, that's exactly what happened to me. My first networking lunch when I became a board director, so uh, ten years ago, no, eleven years ago, time flies. Um, I sat at a, I sat in a restaurant with twelve gentlemen, twelve men. 85% of them had gray hair. And I looked around and I just went, where's my network? All these people are going to retire before I get there. I okay. need to create my own network. So I, I then went out and talked to three or four friends and said, should we, should we create our own little future, future network? You know, we're, we're the, we're going to be the next, the next big thing. We're going to be the future of the construction industry. Let's go. And, and I was looking for the, I was looking for the mid-30-year-olds, the early 30s, you know. And it 
it took me two years to get it off the ground. And by the time I'd done that, I'd become, you know, I think I was a board director four, I was MD three or four years later. And it was like, oh, actually, I'm the here and now. I'm not the future. And actually, it turned out that I think a lot of the decision makers are now the my age, the late 30s, early 40-year-olds, and the 56-year-olds uh-huh. are, are are still there in a big corporate way, but not in the not in the way that it used to be. It used to be a very old old boys brigade, old boys club, and it's and it's not anymore. I think I think there are so many entrepreneurs out there i think it's become much more popular to set up your own business and do your own thing mm-hmm. so now when there used to be five architects that you deal with on a general basis there's now 55 architects and you've got no idea which one's going to get the next job so you just gotta you just gotta make sure you ingratiate yourself to as many people as you can but have really good relationships with probably a select few that you know you you know what's going on mm. do, do you when it comes to kind of winning work have you been very uh kind of thoughtful in making sure that you're kind of going deep in certain sectors like the high-end resi and your higher education and science facilities or have you kind of looked outside of those sectors which you've already got ex- expertise in and want to do different building typologies or is it too risky I mean that's that's one of the things with construction that's different from say an architect in many ways is that you could get yourself involved in a specialist type of construction and get it wrong and it's there's a lot of risk so having been in the same company for 25 years i've seen quite a lot and right in the 2000 2008 2008 2009 recession as a company we looked to branch out and do other sectors where could we use our our skill set in other okay. sectors didn't work didn't work uh one we didn't really get a sniff of anything and two we did pick up one and it was a it was a disaster. It's just so different to what we were used to, so different to what we were expecting, and that's that's the risk. So, definitely one once bit and twice shy. Uh, right. I've learned from others. Uh, I think what I've probably concentrated on is trying to build re- better relationships. That they're the ones that pick up the phone and talk to me every time there's an opportunity, rather than someone else. I think that's probably where I've gone, and try to consolidate and sorry consolidate our place in those divisions, but. HQR from about 2009 to 2018, 19 was booming, but the others were not, or we weren't really making a big effort in them. Uh, so I made my, my my first point of call six years ago was, and no, no, we need to rebalance the rebalance the books. We, too much, too many eggs in one basket in one in one sector. Mm-hmm. So let's see if we can uh, not not depress the HQR world, the high quality resi world, but let's try and see if we can bring up the science and bring up the landmark and heritage. Because I also think, in my humble opinion, having worked across all the sectors, HQR is really, really difficult. Um, construction is difficult, whatever happens, but when you're in dealing with an individual who it's his own wealth and it's his own wealth creation and it's his own emotion and there it's, a, it's his own house, you go to a different level. Uh, so the emotional turmoil that happens on on a high quality resi job is is amazing. <laughs> so asking someone to, so asking someone to do that for forty years of their working life or now fifty years of their working life, I think is too difficult. So nice. just having that change up, having that ability to go and swap from sector to sector. So going back to your question about the structure, under the divisional directors, we have a pool of resource. So project managers, commercial managers, site surveyors site managers, design managers, they all can they can all cross between sectors. So no one is pigeonholed into the no, no. That's interesting. So, 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 yeah, so no one gets siloed. You're kind of making sure people are getting that experience in different sectors. Yeah, we're trying to grow our people, round our people. Now, don't get me wrong, there are specialists in each division. Uh-huh. If they want a chance to come out and do something else, they can, but some of them are just so specialist that you, you can't really move them. And that's their chosen career, and that's what they wanted them to do. Um, but generally, it's a it's a good it's a good place to be where they got a, a variety. And now, Water Lily is quite an old company. There's a lot of heritage there. I've I mistakenly thought, and you can correct me if I got this wrong. I thought that the the legacy or the heritage had, had always been in the HQR world. But you, you is it? Am I right in thinking you've been doing a lot more education? prior to HQR or? Difficult. Okay, so we, this is our 100th year. We right. turned 100 in April. Amazing. 
Yeah. So it's, it's been a long time and a successful company. It's done that's absolutely, absolutely amazing. A hundred years ago, and actually I think, if I'm honest, I think a hundred years ago, the, the company existed before that. But a, a gentleman called Walter Gent Lilly won a, won a construction company stroke builder's merchant's yard in a game of poker. <laughs> so the day he won it in a game of poker, he took it away and he, and he renamed it Walter Lilly. Right. So that so there must have been a company before that is where I'm got to. So he was a he was a general builder, but I'm gonna actually say if anything, in the first let's get this right, nineteen twenty four, we were so, and they sold the, the family sold the company in nineteen fifty five. So in those first thirty years, they were known for um listed old buildings. Right. More than anything else. Right. When I joined in the 1990s, we had old buildings, we had science, we had retail fit out, okay. Tesco, Tesco stores, fit out, those sort of things. And probably, so old buildings and a bit of resi, but not a lot. In the late 1990s, I think the, f the first proper high quality resi job happened, which was for Ringo Starr. Of the Beatles, and that and that was the start of this. Actually, people want to spend some serious money on their houses. Mm -hmm. that we recognised, uh, and then it took off from there. Uh, you know, we were doing million pound apartment fit outs at that point, which are now mm, tens of millions of pounds. You know, I think the largest high end resi house we've done is sixty one million for one single dwelling. Uh, so it's just, it's gone to a different stratosphere, mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic for us. We love it, but it, it, sometimes it is eye-watering. Eye so that, that's that's quite fascinating then as well. You, you've you seen the, mature, the maturing, if you like, as well of the kind of super prime property market in, in London, in the UK, uh, and how it's kind of, what, what kinds of um, changes have you seen in the, in that, in that market in itself? Just in that market on its own, the probably biggest change is is the change that people want. So it's the pushing the boundaries of possibility. You know, mm -hmm. can we do that? Uh, and some clients really do want to stretch the bounds of possibility. So curving a piece of glass in three different directions to have a look that's a certain way, it's not been done before, and it's mm -hmm. definitely not been done before in a construction site in a construction melee of lots of bodies, lots of people. Uh, so it's just it's, it's probably pushing the envelope is probably the biggest change because it's just always pushing that envelope to see what can be done next no no none, none of the clients that are very wealthy want to see what they've got somewhere else you know it's got to be unique uh -huh. and, and and interior designers and architects love that it's an op it's a real opportunity to be creative and not just have to do the same old same old design and, and do you work primarily you know only in the UK or do you have international work or I'd imagine that kind of clientele as well they've this is not their only house and they've got a number of houses and they might be all over the place and they want to keep the same teams if it was successful so um we're even more limited than the UK we're London and the home counties right okay um, that that's you know round round the M25 really because two two reasons I've always thought about it I have thought, well, why can't, why can't we go further further afield? And I remember a, a client asking us whether we'd go to Dubai to do his house in Dubai. Right. And we said, and, and we, and this is way before my time, and we immediately said no. And I looked at him and went, why? Why no? And the, and the reason why no is the staff, we've employed them to work locally, and our supply chain work locally. So when I became MD, I, the first thing I did is I sent an email to all of my staff saying, are any of you interested in traveling for work? Would any of you work abroad? Mm -hmm. uh, because the client that asked us to go and do it in Dubai, I found out a year and a half later that he paid for everybody to go from England to Dubai to do the job. So all the supply chain, he paid the premium. So the risk, the risk of going working somewhere else is you don't know anyone there so trying to yeah. find a bricklayer or a plasterer or that's going to have the quality you need to do it to the program and everything. It's, it's too big a risk to go and just tip, dip your toe in the water. Mm -hmm. But if a client's willing to go on that journey with you, then what an opportunity that is. 
So now I, I don't say no to anything until I know the absolute understand, I fully, fully understand what the client's looking for. But I've not had that opportunity since, which is disappointing. Um, so it's all about supply chain and who's willing to move and travel and, and give you the reassurances because you go and dip your toe. Even if I said I wanted to go to the Cotswolds mm-hmm. and, I, and I spoke to a supply chain in the Cotswolds, when I'm saying, come on, you need to bring some labor here, please. They'll be like, who are you? This is the first job we've done with you. I've got another client around the corner who I always work for and my labor's going there today because he's more important to me. Uh-huh. So it's just, it's building that up slowly. It's probably under getting an understanding with all the supply chain before you find a job. One thing you really wouldn't want to do is go and find your job and then desperately try and find the right people to do it because you're, you're just not going to deliver the program. That's that's really interesting. That it's Particularly in today's, today's world where businesses are so kind of more international and spread out all over the place it's actually quite refreshing to hear that that, that your expertise has been really localized in in a in a particular area and it might also be really conservative and risk averse and that <laughs> that is our business we've been I've, I, 26 years i've been trained mm. in risk averse so it's you know i don't want to be the person that busts water lily so just be risk averse conservative and deliver what we're good at you know you know what you're good at just deliver it don't yeah try and but, but that's not very entrepreneurial. We're entrepreneurial, is you know, Go and make a difference. Go and grow. Go and be different. Go and do something different. So I, I'm definitely, in the six years being managing director, I've definitely grown into the role. I remember that one of the best recommendations I was given was be yourself. Okay. And I heard it. I listened to it. And I didn't do it for at least nine months. I spent nine months trying to imitate the previous two MDs. It just wasn't me. Just didn't work. Didn't feel comfortable. Hard work. So I just kind of, and then I saw the same person. You went, just be yourself. You can do this. Just be yourself. And then I did, and it's gone from strength to strength since then. So I couldn't, I couldn't recommend being yourself more, more, more strenuously. Love it. Um, in terms of working with other consultants, um, in particular, let's talk about working with with architects. You've you've been in the industry for a long time. What's the change that you've seen in the relationships between architects and a kind of contracting firms like your, like yourself? So I, I, I can say this hand on heart. When I first joined the industry, I worked on a job in Sloan Square, middle of London, and architect was king. Architect was God. What they said went. What they told you to do, you did. Uh, and you didn't do anything different completely turned on its head now wow um and i'm not quite sure why i've been i've been doing some research on this in the last few years trying to understand what's changed and i think there's probably a few things that have changed i think um there's not enough fees to do it properly (laughs) i think the competencies of what the architects are now taught are not what contractors need it's it's probably more conceptual it's about how it's going to look uh, or making sure they met all the regulations they need to meet. But actually, can it fit together? I mean, an art master builder, it was about drawing on a piece of paper so someone could put it together. And it's no longer seen as how does that go together? It's now lines on a paper because it takes a box in terms of a detail being delivered, but have they actually thought it through about how it goes together? But they don't teach that. So I'm not blaming the architects for that. They just don't teach it. Uh-huh. And I think I was talking to someone five, ten years ago about um, architectural technicians who are the ones that draw it and actually work out how it goes together. But even that's a dying art. There doesn't seem to be many people joining that world. So it's it's difficult. I think I think the competencies drifted a little bit. I think it's quite... I, I don't know how many people are going into it anymore. I remember being 15 years of age and thinking I wanted to be an architect. And I was told by an older gentleman that I wouldn't bother doing that, mate. Um, it's all going to be done by a computer. So I just wonder, seven years at university, it's a long time. Yep. Uh, the, the, the salaries aren't particularly good until you make it to partner or you make it up to the top of the tree. So it's a, it's a really hard um, profession to, to, he- to, to succeed in. But also, this, the profession has, has changed its view, changed its ways a little bit in terms of what a contractor needs. And mm-hmm. too many times recently, 
we get told, come on, Walter Lily, you're really good at what you do. You know what we want. Can't you just build it? And you can't sit there and go, well, that's not really the point. The point is you do a drawing under your professional indemnity and we build it. And then when anyone asks why we built it, it's because it's like that or it's not like that. And there's a reason for it. There's a reason why it all goes together. But that seems to have drifted. And I don't mm. know if it's time, resource, competency. It's probably a bit of everything. And so do you, do you find now that you then you guys are taking on more design responsibility? There's more contractor-led design aspects to to a project and the architects are doing more of a kind of design intent um and then you're and then you're take you're taking on more of their liability as well and 100 percent um which we, we did a we did i'm not going to name the gallery but we did a very nice gallery and it won the sterling prize mm -hmm. and i'm going to say there was 50 something cdps and you kind of sit and go oh, hold on a minute we we designed that because actually there was a concept from the architect and they knew exactly what they wanted it to look like but we were responsible to make it work to bring it all together and we had to employ architects ourselves wow I often, I often speak to the architects and say do you want to finish the designer for us we'll pay you we'll pay you the speed that you're obviously not <laughs> getting from the from the client we'll pay you and we could get so i'm trying to find a way that i can partner up with architects and say look i just need somebody to finish the design i need a technical design so so people can build from it. Because my biggest fear about the industry uh -huh. is that architects are no longer drawing what needs to be built. Main contractors, the building, the management are now graduates from university but don't know how to build. They know how to manage. Oh, you've just lost a, you've lost a, a massive art here, yeah. And then if you go one step further... How many 16-year-olds 16 year do you know that are joining the trade? Because at the moment, we are absolutely reliant on subcontractors and the tradesmen knowing how to put things together. And that is dying out as well. Now, the tier ones, I, I understand, are looking at robots. Mm -hmm. They see the future being robots. Not in my world. Not in a grade one listed building where we're having to refurbish it and find uncover things and work out what we're going to do. And the answer I got was, no, 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 because once that robot knows how to do what you've taught it for that building, then he can send that to all the other robots and they all then, or they all then know how to do it. I said, that's great, but we won't come across that again. That's bespoke, that's unique. We'll have to do that on every occasion. It's mm -hmm. not going to work. And it's a, it's a dying art that the, the bricklayers that can do uh, nip, nip tucking, you know, there's probably about five or six left in the country that know how to do it. Once they're done, that's it. It can't be done anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a worry for me that we are getting to a point where we're going to have people looking at people go, well, how do we put this together? How does this work? If there was a drawing that explained it, you could teach someone, look, okay, look, these two bits go together and we can see that, we can work it all out. And, and maybe AI is the future. Maybe there's a 3D model where it gets projected and people just have to put things next to each other so it all fits together like a flat bill type, you know, flat pack type building, but I don't see it. We we really need to bring more people into the industry. Yeah, that's and that's that's really a very astute observation that you know that architects, you know, architects in the industry complain as well that they they don't have people who can do detailing. That people don't know where, how to get the comp. They don't. It's difficult to find expertise and competency, and um, you know what comes out of university is. It's it's very questionable what the skills are. I mean, we just I mean look at what's happened recently with with Grenfell and the kind of accountability there, which is you know there's a massive lapse in basic competency across the board, across the board. And the the, the architect has really you know the, they've been very responsible there for just lack of who, nobody was taking any responsibility for what was you know whether this thing was actually suitable, and we're seeing that right across the construction industry this kind of diminishing of knowledge and and skill and it's yeah it's like well if if we don't preserve it or people aren't interested in entering the trades or architecture profession is not training these kind of construction competencies there's a problem so to, that that's a hundred percent agree add to that you're getting post every second of every day yeah. so 20 years ago the post used to arrive at 11 o'clock in the morning 
You'd read the letters in the post file, you digest them, you'd work out who's dealing with what, and then you go back on with your day job. <laughs> now, everything is so immediate. It is so, there's an email on your machine, you now know what to do, get on with it. So back, back, back in the good old days, you had time to look at stuff. You had time to make sure the installation was the right installation to go in the right hole. <laughs> now, you haven't got time. No one's got enough time. Everyone wants everything tomorrow. Instant gratification. Clients, everybody, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And people just don't have enough time to do their job properly. So add that back to competency and ability uh, and professionalism. It's, yeah, not there's a lot of what the answer is. A lot of challenges, a lot of challenges. I asked my team within a year of being MD, because people said, you know, sit tight, don't change too much in your first year. And at the end of my first year, I said, okay, I want to make one change and one change only. I want to turn emails off between 10 and 4. And they went, you can't do that. That's, that's <laughs> ridiculous. You can make changes, but small ones, you can't do that. That's out of this question. And I said, well, why? What's the problem? Well, what happens if there's an emergency? I said, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, but I think if there's an emergency, the phone was a wonderful invention. You know, people can use the phone. You know, I'm not asking them to go completely silent. I'm just saying, don't sit at a computer for six, seven, eight hours of the day reading posts that's coming in because you'll never get anything worked on. <laughs> but apparently, I was told I couldn't go back. <laughs> I still want to do it. Six years later, I still think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. People that... Read it in the first hour of the day and read it in the last hour of the day because I think if you read all your emails in one go, in one hour, it's quicker. You get, you get, you're more efficient in that way. Well, I, I think, you know, this, this is protecting people's ability to focus or have a ten, you know, place attention onto one thing. And, and you know, these sorts of things that you're talking about as well, like the, the ability to solve complex construction problems requires that it requires focus. It requires deep thought. Okay. It used to require people look, standing around a drawing table, looking at a drawing, okay, and, and, You'd flick through four drawings before you found the one you wanted, and then you'd mm -hmm. sit there with people and go, "So how are we going to do that?" And you'd brainstorm it on a screen, one person, uh, and and they zoom into one little part and go, "How am I building that?" They don't now see the big picture to the point where I've looked into just television screens mm -hmm. to become the new drawing boards and make them touch screen and see if we can draw on them. And, and as a as a group. I, 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 we insist that our teams sit together once a week looking at all the new drawings that have arrived that week so they can brainstorm them together because one will see one thing, one will see another thing and they work together. But it's hard work trying to drag them away from now what they're used to to try to do something different. Have you guys dealt with the, the kind of work from home challenges? So you've got more team members who want to work from home and, and again in, in construction, I mean architects have really struggled with this where you've got people wanting to work from home and the exact scenario that you're describing of a team working around a drawing and figuring stuff out, that suddenly gets lost when you're working from home and add into that distraction, add into that, there's just a lack of the core competency. Again, it's kind of compounding something. How, how have you guys kind of managed the sort of work from home and, you know, construction being even more, you know, you've got to be on site. Yeah. So Interestingly, before COVID, in the January before the March 2020, we introduced flexible working right, and working from home um, because we were actually trying to treat our head office staff better because our construction staff, do you know what? They, I'm not going to say they do flexible working, uh -huh. but they cover each other. If one of them's got a dishwasher engineer coming out and he's going to be a little bit late in, the others will cover for him and we would never know. But the office staff have to book half a day or a day off for a dishwasher engineer to come around when they could actually just sit at home and do some work while they wait for them, they do their work and then they come in or they do the rest of the day at home. So we thought it was a good thing and it, thank goodness we did it because we were set up ready to go and it was it worked brilliantly. We of course had the construction work because it was in the well, well I, I want to work from home. They're like, mm, really sorry, you, <laughs> you've chosen a career that means you're on site full time. I, we will occasionally let our project leaders work from home if they need some quiet time to look at a program and just shut themselves away from the hustle and bustle of the site. My biggest thing is the learning. When people are working from home, whether they're senior or junior, the juniors aren't listening and hearing and watching and picking things up. Uh, to what I've done, 
we've actually just moved offices and we've improved the offices because I was told by somebody, um, a WeWork person, someone on top of the WeWork said, um, entice them back in. <laughs> you, you're never going to be able to force them back in because the world's changed and pe- if you won't offer them it, someone else will. So you can't force them, but you can entice them, make it a really nice place to work. So I've made it a really nice office. Uh, we do uh, first Friday of the month, we do a, a group lunch. Last Friday of the month, we have, I think every Friday actually, half past four, the beer and wine fridge starts just to try and entice people in on a Friday because uh, we all know what happens on a Friday. So it's just making them loved a little bit more, making sure they feel respected and loved and looked after um, means they've got the opportunity to come back in. And, and I, 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 not only for the business, not only for training, not only for learning and improving his business, people's own well-being, spending their whole lives in their house. Uh-huh. It's no good. No good for yeah. them at all. They need to get out. You, the, London's amazing how busy London is now because I think people have realised that there's no social life at home. Uh-huh. The social life is out and about, meeting people, talking to people. Um, but it is the I, the older generation that enjoy it a bit more and say, well, do you know what? I'm better at home than I am in. So I'm staying at home. You sit there and go, well, I need you to teach these people and you can only do that by coming in. Yeah, and that's a that's a nice pool because there's not many human beings that don't like teaching others what they know. Yeah, brilliant, love it. I think that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation there, Chris. Um, that's been absolutely fantastic. So insightful uh, to hear about your career and your, um, you know, working with architects and just the the inner workings of a you know an amazing construction company. So thank you for sharing and. Um, Perhaps we'll do it again one day, but I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the time. It was good to talk. And that's a wrap. Hey, Enoch Sears here. And I I have a request since you are a listener here of the Business of Architecture podcast. Ryan and I, we love putting this podcast together. We love sharing information as much as we can glean from all the other industries that we're a part of to bring it back to empower you as an architect and a designer. One thing that helps us in our mission is the growth of this podcast simply because it helps other architects stand for more of their value, spreads the business information that we're sharing to empower architects together so architects, designers, engineers can really step into their greatness, whatever that looks like for each individual. And so here my my simple ask is for you to join us and be part of our community by doing the following, heading over to iTunes and leaving a review of the podcast. And as an expression of our sincere thanks, we would like to give you a free CEU course that can get you one professional development unit, but more importantly, will give you a very solid and firm foundation on your journey to becoming a profitable and thriving architect. So here's the process for that. After you leave us a review, send an email to support at businessofarchitecture.com. Let us know the username that you use to leave the review, and we will send you that free training. On the training, you'll discover what 99% of architecture firm owners wish they would have known 20 years ago. And the other 1%, well, they just didn't even know that they didn't know. Head over to iTunes and leave us a review now. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable.